Hello and welcome to AXA Coral Live. We're broadcasting to you from Curaçao in the Caribbean. And we are based at Kamabi Research Station. And welcome to this live investigation. We'll be looking at some of the threats to the coral reef. Now we're based at Kamabi. That's in the Southern Caribbean on the island of Curaçao. So we're just north of the coast of Venezuela and that's part of the Netherlands Antilles, other islands, Aruba and Bonaire. Now we're broadcasting from a research station that's great for visiting scientists, great level of facilities here. They can come from all over the world for weeks or months to carry out the research projects and they can use Kamabi as a base even if their home universities are in the US, UK, Netherlands, Germany, wherever. And the great thing about coming here is the facilities that allow them to do their research. So we've got dry labs, we've got microscopes, we've got places where you can analyse your samples, start doing some data work. We've also got wet labs and that's where you can maybe conduct some experiments, set that up, try and recreate in miniature the life on the reef and analyse certain aspects of it. But it's a field research station and the reason Kamabi is here is its proximity to the reef. So we've got amazing reef just 50 metres offshore. We've even got some corals growing on the jetty just here. And so scientists can access the reef, get their scuba gear, walk down the beach and go off and collect samples. Some even using rebreathers to get deeper on the reef. So We've been having an amazing week. We've had interviews with the science team here. We've had live investigations. And bringing us back to today, it's a look at a, an issue that's come up a lot over the live chat and through the pre-submitted questions. And that's what's happening to the reef and some of the threats it's facing. Let's just see who's joining us uh, for this. Um, we have um, schools from uh, or in Lithuania, Canada, Hong Kong, Greece, Germany and Poland. Uh, welcome one and all. And special shout outs are going to Mrs. Roop's fifth grade science students at Jonesville uh, Middle School in Lee County, Virginia. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, we have Union Point Academy watching from the US. Fantastic to have you with us. Uh, tuning in from Canada. We have Silver Star Elementary and David Leader Middle School. And hello also to Livingston High School, all the teachers and students there in the USA. And we have also just seen this come in on the chat. We have Frederick Collins and they are north of the 60th parallel. So above 60 degrees in latitude uh, in Canada's Yukon in Whitehorse. And that is a, a chilly minus 10 Celsius. I can definitely say that uh, cold temperatures are my preferred. I'm, I'm getting pretty hot and sticky here in the tropical heat. Um, but if you want to know what the cold is like, perhaps even colder than the minus 10 currently in Whitehorse, do tune in to Arctic Live uh, coming to you in May next year from Spitsbergen, from Swabod. But um, let's go over what we're looking at today. So we're looking at a few things. We're going to be doing a live investigation together. Uh, we're going to be looking at some science terms, uh, some science processes, some skills, especially predicting and observing. We're going to uh, then have a little bit of a chance for you to ask any questions you might have about the reef and the changes happening here. Now, I can see some great pre-submitted questions already but do take the opportunity to log into the live chat and submit any other questions you have either in advance just now as we get started or during the course of the call and those will come through to me um, here in Curaçao and we'll do our best to answer them all. So just to start off here Let's see what we need for this first live investigation. And I'll talk through the, the science 
um, just beforehand. Uh, but just to get tables ready, you'll need a jar or container. You'll need a straw. Reusable straw is always great. You'll need some water from the tap. You'll need a pH indicator, this is a sort of typical pH indicator strip from a school. You can also look to use pH indicators, natural ones as, such as red cabbage dye. Uh, we'll be using an electronic pH meter because it gives that uh, finer scale and so we can track the pH um, that we'll be looking at. Get those items ready between the students if you're joining in live. We've got a little test for you, a couple of anagrams while you do that. And we'll back with you and take you through the basics of the science and then we'll do the live investigation together. So a couple of anagrams, see if you can work those ones out. It's just to take the... So I wonder how you got on with those two terms and we'll be using them shortly. The first one pretty tricky, uh, carbon dioxide, but hopefully you got the second one a little bit easier, a bit shorter with acid. Um, so we're gonna come to those in a bit. We're gonna look at the process of ocean acidification and we'll, and we'll be modeling that uh, over the course of this live investigation. Now, ocean acidification is the name that we give to a process whereby carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is absorbed into the ocean, into the waters of the ocean, dissolves and essentially becomes carbonic acid. So it changes the pH of the ocean, it changes the acidity of the ocean. We measure acidity using a pH scale. So you may have come across this in science before. So the lower the number, the higher the acidity. So we have substances like lemon juice that we know are quite acid. And so those will have a lower pH. In fact, household vinegar, a pH of about three. Pure water, will have a pH of about seven. And then we'll find salt water has a higher pH because it's less acid, it's got more minerals in it. And even more, we'll get into sort of, you know, the, the, the bleachers and other things which are even less acid than that. So the pH of the ocean, if we're looking at the ocean, is now about 8.1 units. That's decreased over the past oof, 250 years since the 1750s, since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Revolution. It's gone down from 8.2 to about 8.1. Now that 0.1 of a unit decrease may not seem like a lot, but it represents a 30% increase in acidity. So we start to see this link between increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, coming back to carbon dioxide, and then an increase in acidity, a decrease in pH. 
Now, is that change in the ocean caused by increased carbon dioxide? Well, there's one way we're going to find out. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our jar and we are going to use this as a mini ocean. I'm just going to put this down and put some water on it. This is just tap water. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to breathe out, blow through the straw. I'm going to put carbon dioxide coming from my respiration and put that through my mini ocean and see what happens to the pH. But before I do that, I need to know what the pH is to start with. I'm going to take my pH meter on here and give this a bit of a stir. So this is tap water, so we're expecting sort of between about 7.5. In fact, it's a little bit higher. So, what about 7.93? And I'm trying to predict what will happen to this pH as I put carbon dioxide into the water. Put the cap on the pH meter again. There we go. So, some top tips on blowing through a straw. There's one chance really where you're told to blow through a straw. <laughs> uh, if you're doing this, don't have the cup too full. Don't blow really hard, so just don't do this. Because the water goes everywhere. So be a bit more careful than that. So blow nice, slow, steady, um, blowing through there, getting the carbon dioxide through it. And also take a break every now and again. So we don't want you to run out of puff. Um, what we'd like is to take it in turns if you're working in groups. For If you want to just be careful, then you know, have, a, have a straw each. And we'll all do this together. We'll put uh, one minute's worth of puff uh, through our mini oceans and see what happens there. Um, Ellie, can you, can you give me a, a countdown? Are you all ready? Three, two, one, go. There we go, a minute's worth of puff. And then I would like you to think about what will have happened to the pH. What do you think is going to happen? So we're about 7.86, 7.9 before. I'll just give a quick stir with the pH meter. And I wonder whether this is going to go up or down. If I'm putting carbon dioxide into my mini ocean, will the pH go up or down? What do we think? I'm just going to turn this round, bring it up here. What have we got there? 6.665. 6.662. 6.62. So we've gone down by over a whole unit 
of pH. And we're gonna, let's see if that, that trend continues, if I put a little bit more carbon dioxide in there. So just take this out again, put the cap on. And one more minute, see how well you get on. There we go, so that's the second minute. And we'll see what happened there to the pH. I'm just gonna put my glass down and get my pH meter back. I was about 6.6, 6.5 last time. 6.61, I think. 6.61, so we'll see what we think might have happened to the pH. So I'll just bring this up. Well, how are we, how are we doing on there? 6.43 and falling. And falling. So it seems like the first batch of carbon dioxide really um, accelerating there and now just falling down below, below 6.3. 6 okay. 6.34. Okay. Getting close to 6.3. Brilliant. Getting close to 6.4. And if we get a close up of this figure just now. Perfect. Wonderful. So, what we've seen here is a addition of carbon dioxide to our mini ocean. And that addition of carbon dioxide, there's been a change in the ocean chemistry, so the formation of carbonic acid essentially. And that has dropped the pH, has increased the acidity. It's not this rate, of course, the ocean's much bigger. It's not this rate that's happening in the ocean, as, as we've talked about, but it's a similar process. But the ocean chemistry is changing fastest at the moment for about the past 300 million years. So definitely the changes are happening in the open ocean, but of course not as fast as in uh, our tiny, tiny jars of ocean. Now, why does all this matter? Why does the addition of carbon dioxide and the change in the pH of the ocean matter? We're going to look at our next live investigation now and it's really thinking about what this is made of. So this is a coral skeleton. It's what is created by the coral polyp, the coral animal. It's basically its skeleton structure. And this is made from calcium carbonate. That's the same mineral as chalk and limestone. By taking calcium carbonate from the ocean and by creating these structures. I want to see now what kind of impact lower pH or higher acidity levels would have on calcium carbonate. For this, you just need a couple of things. I'm just going to put the pH meter away. Get rid of this water. So we need a jar again. We need um, some acid, some vinegar, we spoke about earlier. 
and we need something that resembles the calcium carbonate structure of coral. I'm going to use chalk for this, but you can also use shellfish, the shells, and get them from a, a local fish shop or something. Oysters are particularly good because they've got a lot of surfaces and, and really good to see the reaction taking place there. So I'm just going to do this down on the bit of jetty in front of me. I'm going to put some of the vinegar into this jar. I'm going to put my coral, as it were, into the vinegar. Might break it up a little bit. And we're just going to observe what happens here. What can we see happening? So just have a look at that taking place on the screen. And what can we see? Something is definitely going on. So I can see a chemical reaction here. And in fact, if I look at the chalk that we did earlier today, so I'm just going to put this one down and bring the other one up from earlier. I'm just going to give this a bit of a swirl. Because sometimes we see that it's quite hard to pick up, but we can start to see the chalk dissolving slightly in the jar. So you can see that reaction between the calcium carbonate and the acid, the vinegar. That's not exactly what's happening to corals. So when we talk about ocean acidification, we're not talking about, you know, putting your foot into the sea and it dissolving off. Projections for the end of the century, perhaps pH of 7.7, 7.8 depending on how we behave. But the way that it impacts the coral is in a couple of ways. By ocean acidification, decreasing the amount of calcium carbonate available, corals have two choices. If something's a bit scarcer, it takes more energy to get it. So corals may decide and other animals may have a favour in terms of having more fragile structures. The, the coral structure may be more fragile. The shells of oysters, particularly on the Pacific Northwest, may become more fragile. At the larval stage, there's also impacts. And if an organism is using more energy to build its shell or structure, it has less energy for other functions, and that might be uh, for growth, for reproduction, for fending off predators, that kind of thing. So there are knock-on events connected with ocean acidification, and those have been studied across a variety of different species around the world. So what we've looked at today is we've looked at two investigations. We've looked at an investigation that is focused on predicting a change, observing a change, and it's one that you can do in a science classroom later where you're plotting how that change happens over time at one minute intervals. We've also observed what happens when you place chalk or a seashell in vinegar and try and think about the impact that might have in the wider environment, the potential impact on the coral reef. We're going to move on now to the Q&A section of this live lesson. And to give you a little chance to tidy things away, to get any questions you've had from this up on the live chat, and also to test your knowledge 
we've got a couple of prediction questions for you coming right up. Welcome back, and how did you get on with those? Uh, the first question about reef loss in the Caribbean. We've got about a 50% decline in coral cover, well, over 50% uh, since the 1970s. And perhaps this is where we've seen coral loss um, happening soonest uh, with the human impacts from the populations living around here. But it's not all doom and gloom. We've got the second question looking at Bonaire, looking at how the reef has recovered after two big events. We had Hurricane Omar in 2008 uh, and the, the strength of that storm battering the reef and, and sort of destroying the corals. And then two years later in 2010, a warming event that also harmed the coral communities. But it's great to see that given the right conditions, given the right management, that in the years since then, in the 10 years since, that we've seen the, the reef recover to levels before those two. So up to about 46, 47% reef coverage was absolutely fantastic. What we're gonna look at now is the questions that you've been sending through. And it's really great to have these, thank you so much. There's a lot of glare in the tropical sun, so forgive me if I sort of move around a bit. Ellie will do her best to keep me in focus, um, making life difficult. Uh, so we have, uh, from Jonesville Middle School in the US, we have how many people make up your research team and what are their backgrounds? Now the research teams here are quite varied. Um, normally you have, I mean, they're all sort of marine science um, backgrounds. Uh, so it's not a sort of big multidisciplinary um, research. What you'll have is a team looking at sponges, normally with two lead experienced um, researchers and then some PhD students or master's students to help there and develop their own projects. Um, we have the team resident here at um, Karmabi, so we have Christian Marhaver, uh, Mark Vermey and uh, Lucas who we spoke to on um, Monday, part of that research team. We've got a deep reef team um, with Pim um, and Ali, and they've got a group of researchers who are training up to be deep divers. Uh, we have the Morial team. So there's about five, six, uh, three, between two and six, two and eight people in each of these different research teams. Um, again, from, from Jonesville, what has been your favorite experience during your ocean research I think my favourite thing was definitely seeing the coral reef for the first time. That amazing uh, diversity of colour, diversity of shape, uh, different animals, uh, the movement, the beauty um, was quite, quite amazing. So if you can go diving on a reef, I highly recommend uh, that you do. Um, next question coming up. Um, what can we do to help preserve our oceans if we don't live near an ocean? That's a really, really great question. So there's, there's three things to think about. How we change the earth systems, and that will affect the ocean as well. I'll come into these in detail. What we put into the ocean and what we take out of the ocean. The earth systems, a lot of in the news about uh, global warming, excess carbon dioxide. It doesn't matter where that carbon dioxide comes from. It's a system-wide issue. And so we've talked about ocean acidification and we've talked a little bit about ocean warming. 
So cutting down on carbon emissions helps. Uh, in terms of what we put into the ocean, every, anything you put down your drain pretty well ends up in the ocean. So just, just think about it. Um, the reef can be harmed from agricultural runoff, from, from fertilizer washing in. And then what we take out of the ocean. So if you um, choose to eat um, seafood, then think about where that comes from. But I think it, it's really important if you are far from the ocean, a lot of these things I've talked about, eating responsibly, um, being considerate when you throw things away, uh, looking after the earth systems or something you can do for any environment and the ocean will benefit and very simply you know learn to love or, or fall in love or increase your wonder or learn more about the amazing environment whether that's near you um, or it's further afield uh, what is the coolest thing you've ever found in your research of the oceans well at the moment as you can see sitting in the bright tropical afternoon uh coolest is top of my mind uh and i, I think back to, to some arctic expeditions uh but the coolest thing that we've ever found i mean the discoveries i mean i think you know listening to some of the work being done here on sponges and discovering how important sponges are to the reef is really really exciting uh, so do watch back uh, any of the sponge work we've done earlier today but we do have a sponge special um, meet the expert with um, Nick coming up just after this so I think learning more about sponges and my own personal discovery was seeing my first Christmas tree worm sorry I'm just bending around all over the place what do you think is the future of the coral reefs if pollution and environment, environmental conditions continue to worsen. So, if we continue to crash our planet, then that's what we're gonna do. And, and, I, and I think it, it has to be that, that obvious. Is if, if we continue, um, and I, many, many people don't, and, and some people do, but if we, if we don't find a way that as part of nature we can live in harmony with the rest of nature then um, uh, it's pretty obvious I think um, the path um, that we'd be on. Um, I think we all know in our heart of hearts uh, how to live more in harmony with nature and I, and I think it's just a question of doing so. Um, here we go, we've got some great questions come through from the Vanakioti Foreign Language Institute in Greece. Um, F. Stathia would like to know how much time coral reefs need to be created? Uh, that's a really great question. Uh, so the Great Barrier Reef is about 20,000 years old. Uh, so what you find often is reef grows on reef, grows on reef, grows on reef. Uh, so these structures are built up over many decades. In terms of, you know, reef regrowing, um, it can happen in months. Um, in a disturbance, but what we were talking about actually a couple of nights ago uh, was a way in which our understanding of reef recovery and, and reef decline um, is slightly skewed. So when a reef um, encounters a warming event or there's some other big, big event, the decline is pretty rapid and so it's very easy to see, you know, I was here last year and the reef coverage was 45 percent on here this year and it's 30 percent that that's a big difference but the increase as it grows back over decades is quite slow so if you come back you know there's only maybe a one percent difference and that can skew our understanding but really what scientists are talking about reefs needing about 20 maybe 30 years in between these big damaging events um, to, to recover properly. So these bleaching events or storms have occurred, occurred naturally over the centuries and they just need about 20 to 30 years of, of, of no bad things happening um, for the reefs to recover. Um, Effie, how do corals reproduce? Uh, they reproduce in two ways. There's an annual spawning, um, releasing eggs into the water 
and also once the larvae have landed on the bottom of the ocean, uh, they reproduce asexually, uh, in a, so basically almost cloning, in a process called budding. So they split into two, so there's two polyps, and then each of those split into two, there's four polyps, etc., etc., etc. So they reproduce in two ways. I'm going to have to put this in the shade, otherwise it will blow up and disintegrate. Um, Agnesa, how many coral reefs have been destroyed? It's a really, really good question, and we, si we simply um, don't know. I mean, we, we, we can look at overall decline on reefs, but the other thing is it, there isn't complete destruction. So s maybe there's a loss of coral uh, somewhere, and then maybe a different coral grows back, or not all of them grow back, but one is more successful. So our reefs are, are definitely changing, and some are... Um, some are experiencing a lot of decline, but just to, to put it in perspective, you know, we've, we've, we had sort of 30 odd percent decline on the Great Barrier Reef, I think, um, in the latest mass bleaching events. 50 percent decline on average here uh, since the 1970s. And then there are these spots of, of recovery. Uh, we have Apostolos. Um, are there any organizations that are fighting to preserve coral reefs? There are stacks of organization. We've got Kamabi putting the research in to understand coral reproduction and help with coral recovery here. Uh, another organization based here, Seacore International. Um, but there's, there's lots of research teams and groups, Blue Ventures, another um, really great um, organization looking to work with communities to preserve um, the reef. They've done really great work in Madagascar and beyond. Um, all students would like to know, are those who destroy the coral reefs punished? Are there laws to protect them? Um, it's a really great question. And so you, you, you'd need to have a, a variety of laws uh, to protect the coral reefs. So you'd need to have some fishing laws um, if you wanted to reduce the impact of overfishing or destructive fishing techniques. You would use, have to have uh, farming laws um, so as not to use too much fertilizer, uh, you'd have to have um, tourism laws so you don't build big hotels too close um, to the edge of, of where the reef is. You'd have to have carbon emission laws um, to reduce the amount of carbon coming into the atmosphere. You need to have sewage and wastewater laws. So these are huge amounts of different laws um, that we need to have to protect the reef. And if those laws are in place, um, then people could be prosecuted. Um, but there isn't such a thing as a coral reef law. Um, there's a whole lot of different legislation out there. Or that could, or maybe even should be out there. Uh, here we go. Additional shout out to um, Peters Colony Elementary, fourth graders in the Colony, Texas. I really hope you've warmed up today. I know it was completely, completely chilly for you yesterday probably not compared to our viewers in uh, the Yukon, but definitely uh, to what is normal for November in Texas. Um, I'm sure you could do be a separate chat on comparing temperatures of classrooms um, of those of you who are watching. Um, and, and more, we have the students from Colegio uh, San Patricio in Monterrey, Mexico. Say hi to your high back. Um, why is, okay. So I've got here, tides in the UK, how quickly is the acidity level of the ocean rising? Well, we've, we've, I don't know what the current exact trend is, but we've seen a sort of, as we mentioned before, a drop from 8.2 in about 1750 to about 8.1 now, and then a projection for about 7.7, 7.8 uh, by the end of the century. Would alkaline oceans mean huge coral reefs? <laughs> it's going to get a bit technical here. Um, the problem is, is the availability of calcium carbonate and this specific type of calcium carbonate, aragonite, um, that the, the coral polyps after to build its structure. 
So it's really the fact that the acidity reduces that amount because the technical term is the calcium carbonate buffers that. So it's not any alkalinity that we're really looking at. It's the, it's the aragonite saturation levels um, that give more building blocks for the reef. So it's the availability of more dissolved limestone chalky stuff in the ocean and it's not directly connected to alkalinity levels. Uh, so I, it gets quite complex when, you, when we get into questions like this. I do put on the live chat if you want me to try and break that down a bit more. Um, we have fourth graders um, in Peter's Colony Elementary. Uh, what is causing the most acidification of the reefs? Um, acidification uh, really being driven um, by increased uh, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. I don't have the latest figures about what's causing um, that most of that growth, um, but I know there was a, a paper out um, just a few weeks ago looking at the different categories. I think um, uh, SUVs may have been up there, and I think flights may have been up there, driving the most recent growth um, in carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so that growth in atmospheric carbon dioxide is what's driving ocean acidification. Um, please remind us what was the start of the acidification of the oceans. So, the, 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 I mean, just to put it into broad levels, um, you really have an interplay between, if you put it sort of, you know, in one way, you have an interplay between limestone, chalky stuff, and, and, and carbon dioxide. And it's, it's over, over the, the centuries, you've had, uh, if you can picture the white cliffs, uh, white cliffs, white cliffs of Dover, um, so big chalky cliffs, uh, and that is lots of nice calcium carbonate going into the ocean and counteract, counteracting uh, the impact of carbon dioxide dissolving. So there's, there's an equilibrium, and at times over the past millions of years, that equilibrium has has changed and levels have increased and then gone then gone back again. Uh, Last time we saw the rate of change as fast as now uh, has, was about 300 uh, million years ago. I, I didn't quite get the whether that answers your question, but hopefully it does. Um, Silver Star Elementary in British Columbia. Is coral considered endangered yet? Certainly. Um, varieties of coral are considered endangered. The elkhorn coral um, an example of that. Um, and so the, the trade in coral, um, illegal in many countries, you know, the US, you can't import coral into the US, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, great question here. Does the plastic in the ocean change the acidity of the ocean? Really, really great question. Um, it's not something I'm, I'm you know, completely sure of, but just basing on what I know is that the plastic in the ocean um, doesn't react um, with the ocean terribly. Um, it's a hydrocarbon and it is, in some ways, the hydrocarbon itself is a fairly sterile um, molecule. So there are lots of bits around plastic that can change the ocean so there can be uh, pollutants that attach to the plastic and in fact a lot of plastics are only 50% actual plastic plastic and the other 50% is, is additives and some of those additives uh, can be harmful as well but I, I don't know of any research into whether ocean plastics change acidification um, but if, if, if it did I don't think it would it would have as big an effect as the increases in carbon emissions. So I seem to have got broken here. Yep, that's, thank you very much. Um, from um, Yukon in Canada, uh, what would the loss of coral reefs uh, mean to humanity? I think 
Yeah, the loss of the coral reefs. I mean, they are perhaps one of the most endangered uh, ecosystems on the planet in terms of these, these mass bleaching events and the ocean warming. Uh, and science community is saying that it's potentially the first ecosystem that could be reduced uh, by up to sort of 99% in terms of its overall coverage uh, if, if warming were to continue. Uh, and that's a projection. So I think it's it's it, it's a story to us about the direction we're heading in so i think that's the first thing why does it matter i think it matters to us because it's a story of uh, a loss of abundance and i think that should make us all reflect on our own behavior but why does uh, why does a coral reef matter in very basic terms uh let's go through some 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 reasons why the coral reef matters or is important to humans it provides coastal protection worth billions and billions and billions of dollars a year. So it stops storms from battering many cities and settlements around the world. 350 million people rely on the coral reef for food. It covers just 0.1% of the ocean but supports 25% of all marine species so its loss could mean a huge loss of marine biodiversity, different species. There's recreation and all the people who are supported by the tourism industry around here and further afield. It is also the potential producer of many pharmaceutical products that could be the cure for a host of diseases. So we used to think of the rainforest as a source of natural medicine. In fact, the coral reef could be even more important. It's worth an estimated $375 billion a year if you take all those services and products together and potential. So both as an early warning signal as a way that we can reflect on our own relationship with nature and also in that more practical aspect uh, the loss of, of coral reef would be devastating. Well thank you so much for all your wonderful questions and thank you for being part of this live investigation. Uh, hopefully it warms up uh, where you are but very much looking forward um, to seeing you again online, but for now, it's goodbye from Curacao and goodbye from Coral Life. Bye-bye.